children. God is love. God is love. Anybody have trouble seeing something that's right in front of them? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right up over there. I, I'm Eric can tell you. I am the least observant person out there. I really have trouble seeing things right in front of me. Do you know that Eric well he used to have hair? He used to have <laughs> he used to have long hair. Let me let me show you this picture. I had long hair too. Look. <laughs> he comes home one day. Let's see the next one. With this. Oh. I didn't notice. I seriously did not notice that he had cut all of his hair off. I'm just not very observant. And I come by it naturally. See, my mother one time received a coffee table as a present from my father. She came into the house placed her belongings on said coffee table and did not ever notice the coffee table was there. So I come by naturally. Now you might not be as as legal as observant as I am, but I've got more than one of you know this. You might see my glasses. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. Or this one here, this one's more fun, I think. You know, I'm looking for my phone. As soon as I find my phone, I'm going to head out the door, and I'll see you shortly. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> Some of us. And 
and he obtains letters that are authorizing him to go into Damascus and arrest anyone who might be associated with Jesus Christ. These are basically arrest warrants, would be what they would be like today. So with these letters in hand, Saul sets off on foot on a six-day journey to Damascus. It takes six days to get from Jerusalem to Damascus on foot to do the will of God, or at least what he thinks was the will of God. Saul was bound for Damascus on this mission of destruction when he's saved by God's mercy and his grace. Now, these past few weeks, we have been looking at the difference between mercy and grace. First thing we heard was that mercy withheld the knife from the heart of Isaac, and grace provided the ram in the thicket. The next week, we learned that mercy runs to forgive the prodigal son, and grace throws a party with a ring and a robe and a fatted calf. Last week, Eric showed us that mercy hears the cry of the thief on the cross, and grace promises him paradise that very day. Today, we find that mercy converts Paul on the road to Damascus, and grace makes him the great apostle. So the difference between mercy and grace is that mercy withholds from us what we deserve, and grace gives us what we do not deserve. Saul headed out ready for this confrontation with the enemies of the law of Moses, and he rode along with his little vigilante committee with the permission of the high priest. And he would do anything within his power to stop the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ and to arrest and or kill his followers. But suddenly, a blinding light knocks him off his high horse. God shows up and he interrupts Saul's plans. He shoots this laser beam of light out of the throne room of heaven and knocks Saul to the ground. Well, suddenly, all the education that he had, all the plans, all the hatred, and the condemnation that had been controlling Saul was all erased in one quick flash of light. Suddenly, Saul became the accused and the condemned. The God of heaven had hunted down the hunter and failed his prey. Now, Saul had not really heard the voice of God until this point. He'd only listened to the voice of religion and to the voices of this world. But now he heard a different voice, a voice with the power and authority that shook Saul to his very core, the very core of his soul. This is the same voice that had spoken the world into existence. It's the same voice that had spoken to Adam in the garden. The same voice that talked with Moses on Mount Sinai and gave him the law. And this very same voice had brought Lazarus back from the dead. It's the same voice that cried out, it is finished, as he paid for our redemption on the cross. And this same voice cries out to all of us today, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. <laughs> and this same voice speaks to each and every one of us and says, this is my will for your life. Do it now. That same voice will be the one we hear one day when we hear, well done, good and faithful servant. I want to hear that voice. I want to know that voice. And when that voice came down from heaven, Saul heard what, what it heard, and he said, why are you doing this to me? What, what, why? See, Saul heard, Saul, Saul heard rather, why are you doing this to me? Well, Saul knew that this was no ordinary voice, but he didn't know the Lord, so he didn't recognize him. And he asks, who are you? Who are you, Lord? And the reply comes back, well, I'm Jesus. I'm the one you have been persecuting. Now I want you to get up, go into the city, and I'll hang out there for a while, and I'm going to send someone to tell you what to do next. Now, God could have killed Saul on the spot. Saul certainly deserved it for what he was doing to the followers of Jesus Christ. He had every reason to kill Saul. But instead, God showed Saul mercy. And he sent him on down the road to Damascus. Have you ever been heading down a road of destruction when God plucks you out of harm's way? I know I have. Many of us have have been in the wrong place at the wrong time at some point in our lives. And 
And we can't believe it when we actually wake up the next morning to find that we are mercifully still here. Do you ever wonder why God continues to extend his mercy to us when we are constantly doing acts of disobedience or sin? Saul had to have been worried. He had been wondering why God was showing him mercy at this point. After all, he'd been persecuting Jesus for quite some time when this happened. You might recall, if you were to read in chapter 7, that he stood over the coats when Stephen was, was persecuted and was killed for his beliefs. But Stephen gave a very long discussion, if you will, or, uh, about who Jesus is. Now Saul heard this testimony about Jesus from not only Stephen, but probably from a lot of believers that he plucked up to take to prison. A lot of these folks witnessed to, to Paul over and over again. And suddenly Paul figures it all out. In a moment, he knows everything he has heard is true. So he understands what Stephen had said, that Jesus died on the cross, and that he died for our sins, for Saul's sins too. He understood that Jesus had been resurrected three days later. He understood that without Jesus Christ as his Savior, he was not going to inherit eternal life. Now he probably didn't have all the theology of it down right away, but he knew that he was dead in his sins without a relationship with Jesus Christ who was showing him such mercy at that point in time. And Saul was instantly changed and eternally changed in a flash of life. Where he was threatening, he was now trembling. Where he was in control, now he's under God's control. Where he could see his future under his control, he was blind, not only to the world around him, but to what his future held. For three days, Saul was blind. Gave him a lot of time to sit and think about what he had done and about maybe what God wanted him to do. It gave him time to think about his life, to repent, to turn around, as we'll talk about in our study today, to learn to depend on God's voice and leading in his life. Then sometimes doesn't God lead us into a blind corner? before we're still enough to listen to what he's telling us to do. Sometimes he leaves us there for a while until we're willing to listen close enough to hear his voice. And it's three days later that God finally speaks to Ananias. Now, can you imagine what Ananias is thinking at this point when God comes along and says, hey, Ananias, I want you to go over and talk to Saul. If you, if I were Ananias, I'm sure I would be sitting there going, what? Are you kidding me? Uh, do you know who this guy is and what he's been doing and, and you want me to talk to him? But God says, yep, yep, go, I want you to go. You know, even a, a strong disciple like Ananias sometimes staggers over what God is asking them to do. But God has a plan. And Ananias was to be the vessel that carried more of God's mercy to Saul. I'm allowing you to see clearly. I mean, each one of us can be a vessel of mercy as we carry that mercy of God out to other people. We can be witnesses as the least of these receives God's grace. I am nice for that. After a little moment of rebellion, and he goes to Saul and he says the most wonderful thing. He doesn't say, Saul, who do you think you are persecuting my friends? He doesn't say any of that. He simply goes to and says, Brother Saul, the Lord has sent me to you. He doesn't pass judgment on him. He doesn't pretend to be better than Saul. He simply accepts him as a brother in the faith and as part of the community of faith. He went to Saul and told him that Jesus had sent him to give Saul his sight and to fill him with the Holy Spirit. And immediately we read something like fish scales falls from Paul's eyes and Saul receives his sight. It's not just his physical sight he gets. You see, he gets his spiritual sight as well. He sees Jesus for who he really is. And when he does, Saul wastes no time at all getting baptized. It says immediately he got up and was baptized. And then he hangs out with the 
Christians in Damascus, I'm sure, asking a whole lot of questions. And shortly after that, we find that Saul starts preaching in the synagogue, <coughs> and no one can believe it's him. Isn't that the same guy who came to arrest us and take us back to Jerusalem for sentencing? Isn't that the one? But their doubts don't show, don't slow Paul down at all, not in the least. You see, Saul answers God's call to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. He does start using his Roman name, Paul, just so the Gentiles will feel more comfortable with him. This man, who once persecuted Jesus' followers, became the greatest missionary the world has ever known. And he has touched the lives of everyone here, every single one. He preached in Thessalonia and Jerusalem and Athens and Corinth and so many other places. And if he wasn't preaching, he was in prison for preaching somewhere. He wrote most of the New Testament, as I mentioned to the kids, which still guides us. About two-thirds of it Paul wrote. Mercy converts Paul on the road to Damascus. And grace calls him to be the great apostle. To read more about Paul's journeys, we find Paul didn't have a very easy life. In fact, it was quite difficult. But through it all, God reminds Paul that his mercy and his grace are sufficient. And if God's mercy and grace were sufficient enough for the Apostle Paul, don't you think his mercy and grace are sufficient enough for all of us? I want to leave you with a story that helps to explain a little bit more about this mercy and grace. In my files, I have a story about a man who was attending a youth ministry class, and he said when he got to class, everyone was doing their last minute studying for the test. The teacher came in, and he showed us a little mercy. He said, I'm going to go over the review, some review, some stuff with you. And so they spent some time before the test going through the review. And most of it was on the study guide, but some of it was not. So the young man questioned the professor and said, where are you getting this information from? He says, well, it's in the book. And you're responsible to know everything in the book. They couldn't really argue with that. Finally, it was time to take the test, and the professor gave the instructions. He said, as I pass these out, they're upside down. Please keep them upside down until everyone has their test, and then I will tell you when you get started. When they turned over the test, every single answer was filled in. And on the last page, following the last question, it read, this is the end of the final exam. All the answers on your test are correct. You will receive an A on the final exam. The reason that you passed the test is because the creator of the test took it for you. All the work you did in preparation for the test did not help you get this A. You have just experienced grace. Mercy withholds from us that which we deserve. And grace gives us that which we do not deserve. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.